X-ray fraction of thin filaments, and I cover some um, the Vispoca space lattice and the Vispoca space of uh, the Vispoca space mapping, and then uh, Euler sphere construction of diffraction, and then uh, so I think as a general, I cover some basics, and then uh, I just one of students ask about uh, um, some other type of data she has seen. And then uh, maybe I can cover uh, a little more the uh, lectures about the super lattices and then uh, the uh, thickness screen use and diffractometry, which is uh, also very useful for, for your, your research. So I'm going to collect some of the data and then I'll uh, you know, slide and I'll, I'll spend maybe half an hour and then I'll, I'll talk about it. <coughs> so today I'm going to uh, talk about the uh, um, the extension of this, uh, this structural things, so domain engineering, and then uh, the reason the domain engineering is important when you probe the so intrinsic properties of uh, materials, and then uh, you really need um, perfect single crystal-like uh, material, like a box single crystal. But when you grow these materials and thin films, and you never, it, it not always get the single crystal material. And you have to some kind of a, um, the, uh, the trick or like a, like an engineering uh, to make a single crystal. So I'm going to uh, have a one uh, example of this related to a multiferrite. I think a lot of some students here interested in magnetic system and then um, multiferrite system. So I'm going to use a different example of this. So <clears throat> as I mentioned that uh, the the research uh, it covers a wide range of uh, the uh, component and it's an interdisciplinary component and theory and, and uh, material design and then uh, some synthesis of materials and then characterize the properties and by characterization techniques and then uh, structure is important. So yeah, structure is the characterize the structural properties and X-ray diffraction. That's what yesterday I talked about and then some of the devices. So today I'm going to talk about <coughs> some of the synthesis. And synthesis of uh, this uh, uh, low symmetry material is a bismuth ferrite. I'm going to talk about today bismuth ion oxide. It's a bismuth ferrite, you call. And then there's no multiferrite system. And then uh, how you actually make the structures more single domain like, and then how you characterize it, and then how the device can be used on, on those things. So I'm going to talk about uh, those things today. <clears throat> so the multiferrites is, um, is in, like recently um, the discovery of some, I mean, the demonstration of uh, uh, unusual and then uh, ferroelectric, ferroelastic and magnetic properties in the, the systems of bismuth ferrites or some other types of multiferrites. And this uh, actually sparks a lot of interest in the in the in the condensed matter physics and the, and the material community. <coughs> the multiferroics the definition is is it's a different definition of people use, but I think uh, um, the general um, the definition of multiferroics is is a cross coupling of different order parameters, and that's uh, what people are interested in. So, for example, the so most of the ferroelectric materials. And this polarization here, P polarization, and induced by electric field. I mean that that is a commonly used ferroelectric. So you apply electric field, and you switch the polarization. I bet in Titan it. I gave those examples. And the magnetic materials like uh, um, ferromagnetic materials or lanthanum strontium manganate or a lot of magnetic systems, you apply the magnetic field and you switch the magnetization. And that is uh, magnetic material, ferromagnetic materials. And then, uh, but there's such a material system, and then uh, you can actually have uh, two different properties coexist in the same same system, which means is material has certain types of polarization characteristics and certain types of magnetic characteristics in the materials. And especially, as I said, in the polar metals, I mentioned the polar metals. So metallicity comes from the uh, the octahedral and then uh, B-site ions, and then polarization coming from A-site ions. 
So you have certain types of, I mean, the two coexisting properties is A site, B site, and then multi thread system, which is very unique nature. Okay? So that means you have those two can coexist in the material, but those two can be cross-coupled. I mean, the cross-coupling is the one we are interested in. The cross-coupling is, is so what is original cross-coupling, and then how this thing happen, how you control this. I think that's all interesting, uh, interesting science. Behind. So, so if you apply, for example, magnetic field, we can switch the polarization, or we can apply electric field, we can switch the magnetization. So that is cross-coupling phenomena. <coughs> that's what um, is a physics point of view, and also device point of view is interesting. This is what we call multifunctional device. The function is, okay, we have most of electronic device and use the electric field or electrical current to, I mean, the, to induce the switching, electrical switching. And then, for example, ferromagnetic, like a hard drives, and we use a magnetic field to switch the magnetization. Even though a magnetic field induced by current, but still the magnetic field is, is actually switch the magnetization. <coughs> So, so electric field control of magnetism is one of the very interesting direction of a lot of is a device point of view and physics point of view. The reason behind is is it's a general trend or general uh, the uh, I mean device community or 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 system community is interested in and uh, low power okay, the, the, because. Uh, the computer runs your computer, you have a, the battery power is uh, limited. Okay, you buy the battery pack, and how many hours you can run the battery, either old computers can battery can run two hours, now a lot of computers can run 10 hours using the same battery pack. And which is more and more the high demand of low power device. It's a very, very low power, which requires, is you don't want to flow a lot of current because the current drives a lot of power. So it's a, it's a low power is, is electric field control rather than is current control. And, and that is a, one important direction you want to get a low power device. And then there's energy saving and then that's the one important thing. And also you want to have multifunctionality which is you can apply electric field. Electric field not only switch the electric polarization, but electric field also can induce the magnetic magnetization, which is so you can multifunctional. You can do that. <coughs> so, some of the um, uh, electronics industry is exploratory, actually exploring and 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 multiplexed magnetic electric device. So, so in order to do that, so one of the scheme the scheme of this using electric field. Electric field switch the polarization and then we already seen that ferroelectric device like that in titanate. But some material has electric field can switch the polarization but the polarization coupled with the magnetization of the material and switch the magnetization. So that is something uh, the community is, is looking for. So for example <coughs> So this is a kind of exchange bias device. An exchange bias device is when you apply uh, the magnetic field, and magnetic field is switched the other direction, and then using tunneling device, you have a tunneling conductance here, depending on the direction of bottom and top electrodes of magnetic direction. So magnetic direction is a ferromagnetic layer, same direction, then spin current, okay, spin polarized, spin current, is, is high, the conductance is high because the density of state in the other side of this and you get the more uh, the tunneling current due to those but you have other opposite direction, there's a less so you can actually use switching this uh, <coughs> magnetization bottom one, maybe this one is a fixed the direction is fixed but you switch this one back and forth and then you actually use uh, this kind of current the measurement of the this by electric field. The by electric field can switch this mag the um, magnetization and then this cross-coupled cross here 
and then change the menstruation year. But a lot of materials people predicted we want to have a ferromagnetic and the multifluorics. The ferromagnetic and then uh, ferroelectric coexisting ferromultifluorics, and just a few, but that's a behavior happens at very low temperature. So another alternative people are trying to use use uh, anti-ferromagnetic and ferroelectric system at room temperature. Okay. <coughs> Rather than ferromagnetic and then uh, the uh, uh, ferroelectric material. <coughs> Sorry. So you have a antiferromagnetic system between antiferromagnetic and then ferromagnetic layer. There's an exchange bias. So you see bias, and then you can switch the magnitude. So that is something we are uh, people are working on uh, on this kind of particular system. The ferroelectric and the ferromagnetic system, and couple the exchange bias coupling, exchange coupling between this antiferromagnetic and ferromagnetic layer, and you switch this by polarization, and this polarization switching and switch this back and forth, and then you can measure the conductance of this layer that is uh, antiferromagnetic. Okay, that is something is a very interesting concept, but there's a lot of science and uh, actual the device point of view, a lot of things. So exchange bias coupling at the interface between bismuth ferrite and ferromagnetic layer. This ferromagnetic layer is cobalt or some kind of metal, which is a strong ferromagnet at room temperature. And this layer, anti-ferromagnetic and ferroelectric is a multiferroex. And this is another ferromagnetic layer, but this is a pin layer, so this is a free layer. The free layer can move by electric field and exchange bias, uh, this layer is pinned, but you can actually use electric <coughs> conductance, the tunneling conductance measurement, and then that is a basic concept. So, magnetic, magnetoelectric coupling between ferroelectric polarization and antiferric motor in bismuth ferrite. Ferroelectric, which is uh, all same as a bismuth ferrite, and an interfering order in this ferrite. And then this is a cross-exchange coupling of magnetic interaction at the interface between antiferromagnetic and then a ferromagnetic layer. That's the exchange bias. Anybody know the exchange bias? Have you heard this? Okay, exchange bias is coupling between antiferromagnetic layer and ferromagnetic layer at interface. It's a very low, uh, the, um, the very short distance, and that's, that's what happened. So previously, and this kind of work is done and the bismuth ferrite system and then when you look at the bismuth ferrite and growth generally growth influence here you see that like the different contrast in the uh, in the PFM images it's a PFM is is a piezo is a probe like a like piezo of the uh, uh, the scanning probe piezo microscopy so you it basically you measure the uh, the piezo response, which is a polarization and then direction. So you can see that this direction and that one as a different domains, okay? the different domains. And then you study this using, this is called the, uh, the electrode. This is called interdigital electrode. And then you have electrode here, apply, apply the voltage here and switch the polarization in the plane. And then that is what people are trying to use and then you have this one problem of this, that this one is a multi-domain structure. Domain is a lot of domains here. And then when you try to look at exactly what the mechanism is happening, and very difficult to uh, determine it, because you have an all average or the complexity of this material. Okay? So this is one way, okay, we, we make this one, and it works, and then that's fine. But the two problems here, and this domain here, due to the multi-domain, and the interpretation is very complicated. But the other problem is, you have a lot of domain boundaries, and we do not know this phenomena is coming from actual domain, or coming from domain walls. Okay, there's a lot of domain walls, and domain wall is another gray boundary-like uh, behavior. So it's a domain wall 
is plays a lot of interesting behavior. Like for example, early stage people believe that in domain war creating ferromagnetic behavior, even though material is an anti-ferromagnetic material. So the domain war contribution is is can be huge, or domain war can be very leaky. But more seriously, this one only switches the three cycles, and then it doesn't go any more than three cycles. So that is a reliability issue. Like we running this one. It does not So the reliability issue, it doesn't go many cycles, okay, stops here. So how can you overcome this kind of there's a reliability issue? And then this reliability another way is like a cycling issue. And then intrinsic property probing is hard and domain or contribution is there. So how can you make this one simple and then it's reliable and then you can have very uh, the understanding these uh, fundamental things can you do. So one thing you can think of here is, is the material itself. There's a lot of domain walls here. Okay, now what I draw here looks very simple. Everything looks like a, nothing there. But actually, reality is you have lots of domain walls. And each domain wall has a different polarization and different magnetization direction. Then we go ferromagnetic layer, and this ferromagnetic layer different regions and behave differently depending on underlying ferromagnetic uh, the, uh, the metaphoric multifragment materials. So then it's clearly okay. This domain wall is a lot exchange bias coupling ferromagnetic layer caused by extrinsic domain walls. Extrinsic behavior, not intrinsic behavior. And fundamental device problem is domain walls shows leakage when switching. So especially when you switch to this one, switching when you apply electric field, the electric field applied it, it actually leakage to the green boundaries, the okay, domain boundaries. Because domain boundaries, a lot of broken bond, and then you have a lot of things happening at the domain wall. And that's where leakage is, is, is a problem. So that means it's when you apply electric field, electric field is not very effective. It's just a and domain wall formation and movement different control because it's a very difficult control. And then, for example, when you make a device, smaller device, this is a whole big device, but a lot of this device gets scaling smaller and smaller and smaller. And then sometimes the device is on top of here. Sometimes device on top of this domain wall behave differently. Okay, so that means depending on where you put your device, your behavior is not uniform. Some of them work, some of them doesn't work. Some of them behave this way, some of them behave that way. It's all is is a problem. Then you get smaller scale. Okay? It's a lot of device requires like a scaling. It's a make a big but smaller and smaller and smaller. And you have to scale it smaller, and then everything is certain way a rule, okay? And then device based on domain wall design will not be scalable down to small dimensions because this problem. And the other problem is deterministic, which means you always happens same way, switch back and forth. You never go other direction. The problem of this kind of things. It one time switch that way, come back, next time going to the other way. So that's, it's not really deterministic. So going that way, come back, but come back here, go back this way, it is kind of unpredictable way of the switching. Okay, so that's what we call the deterministic. You can easily determine the, the first path or the next path is always going the same direction. That's what we call deterministic. So so all kind of this fundamental issue and practical issue, you need something drastically different actual materials to, to probe this. So in order to really attack this problem, we have to really understand the structure of this and the growth issue and then how to overcome this one. Okay? So this Eastman spherite is structure is looks like this. It's rhomboidal structure. Rhomboidal structure is basically you have a cube 
perfect square cube, and then stretch the uh, corner of the one 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 direction, and then stretch the corner like this. Then you have like a distortion of the like a you know what a rhombus rhombus you know that rhombus you have a perfect square. Do you know the kite like a kite make a if you kite shape you square you stretch that way you get diamond shaped thing right that's a rhombus. And then there's a square stretching it, like a rhombus. Same way, cube, you can stretch the corner of this, that's a rhombohedron. Okay, so, so when you do that, when you stretch this, all the A, B, C, it's all the lattice parameters of cube doesn't change because you didn't, you didn't do any distortion of it. It's a, like, a, a, like a compression of uni x, yeah, one. You just stretch it. So all the A, B, and C are the same, but angle is not 90 degrees. Angle is a 90, it's a either smaller or larger depending on the compress or you can stretch it. Okay, so the dismospheric case, you have a stretched along that direction. <coughs> so you have a bismuth atoms here and ion atoms here, and then it's there's a structure here, perovskite structure, and then when you stretch that direction, your polarization direction along the one moment. So that is known, the polarization along the one on one direction. And then one interesting part of this bismuth ferrite is one on one direction of polarization is almost like over 100 micropolar per square centimeter. And then uh, just to estimate what is the size of this 110 means. The barium titanate I talked about, the barium titanate is a ferroelectric material. The polarization direction is along the 100, uh, 0, 0, 001 direction, tetragonal 0, 0, 001 direction. Do you remember that? You stretch it, C direction, so that's the polarization direction, and that's roughly 26 microcoulomb per square centimeter. 26. And then the largest material we know before this is a lead titanate. Okay. Lead titanate is roughly 70 something micro from this okay. That's a both of them the polarization direction along the 0, 0, 001 direction, tetragonal state. Okay, along the tetragonal. But this is a lot bigger than any of the ferroelectric. So we call this a king of ferroelectric lot, very large polarization. Which means a large polarization is good because you apply small each polarization, the polarization is contributed to the signal. The large polarization, and you need a very small device, still can actually provide enough signal to, to detect it. Okay? So here, along the diagonal direction, one on the direction, and polarization is roughly 100, but actually when you make a thin film, it's roughly 110, it's a lot bigger. And then maybe some distortion and the quality of material a lot better. And then this is also single phase room temperature ferroelectric of uh, multiferroids. And then uh, Curie temperature, okay, let's say the, uh, the Curie temperature is 100, 1100 Kelvin, the ferroelectric transition. And yield temperature, antiferroid transition, like a 640 Kelvin. It's a very high. So it's a very stable at room temperature. But this is not ferroelectric. Is antiferromagnetic or ferroelectric antiferromagnetic system. <coughs> so let's talk about structural thing. Okay, this is ferroelectric behavior and antiferromagnetic behavior of this material is somehow coupled with the actual structure around the hydro structure. So, so that's why these domains of this material we call ferroelastic domain. Ferroelastic, ferromagnetic, ferroic domain, but elastically does some distortion. So those things, and then uh, you can see, and then uh, you have this kind of rhomboidal structure can have a multiple way of the degree of freedom. Okay, so when you grow, grow this kind of rhomboidal material on top of those any substrate, and you expect get this rhomboidal can sit different ways. Okay. Just simply, you have, this is an old example. 
the old thermic structure, old thermic lattice. When you disk grow on top of this, uh, on top of here, okay, and you grow this, and then there's number one way I can lay down this uh, cell phone here. I can lay down this cell phone this way. Okay, there's one way. I can lay down this cell phone this way. Okay, so you have a this way and that way. You have two different ways. Well, you can lay down this way. You can lay down that way. You can lay down this way. You can lay that way. You have a lot of degree of freedom. You can lay down this. Okay, you get it? Okay, this is a orthorhombic system. You can actually imagine that it's an orthorhombic system. How many degree of freedom you can grow? and then create complexity of the domain structure. If you have a perfect cubic, this is a perfect cubic, you can lay it, not so cold, it's a perfect cubic, you can lay down any direction, it's, it's the same. Okay, it's not perfect cubic, but it's a, you have a perfect cube, you look, look at the cube, it's as long as a cube is a 90 degree, like a cube on cube, you lay down cube this way, you run that way, and that way, this way, all look same, equivalent. But orthorhombic system is not. Orthorhombic system is because the nature of the actually A, B, and C are not the same. This one and that one are not the same. This is the same thing like a yttrium bearing carbon oxide superconductor. You have a twins, okay, twin formation between this grain and this grain. In between those, we call twin boundaries. Okay, because this one and that one, so in like a mirror plane, the okay, mirror mirror plane that form the twin boundaries, and then. You have these similar things happening in the bismospheric system because symmetry is low, this kind of rhomboidal symmetry, you can lay down this rhomboidal system either this way, either that way, either that way, either that way. So you have four different ways of the structural domain can be aligned. But the structural domain is four different possibilities, but each structural domain for addition direction can be up and down. Same thing like a business, uh, the uh, uh, ferroelectric material of uh, 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 bearing titanate. The tetragonal, the projection can be up, projection can be down, which means that your titanium ions can be up or down with respect to the oxygen. Okay? Well, that means your total, your variation, your total variability of the domain is total 8. Your all eight possible configuration when you lie down your films. So that means when you just do it gross eight domains, and it's completely messy. And then this all, this is one, two, three, four. So each of them pointing the other way, pointing the other way. So these are two variables plus four different variables multiply two times four, total eight. So here. R means rhombohedral, and one, two, three, four means four different variables. So when you grow this, usually people grow this material, and then they try to do study those things. And most of them, I think uh, characterizing the materials, characteristic is fine, but in down the very detail of intrinsic coupling mechanism, you need something better than this and cleaner than this. So, when you have this, this is three-dimensional one, this is a two-dimensional uh, picture here, and because rhombohedral, when you rhombus, when you stretch that direction, and then you have this direction is, is rhombohedral longer direction, and then this angle is not 90 degree, and projection pointing up and pointing down, you make this, this two, R1, R4 looks like that, this one looks like this, so one and four, one and four is this, because it's the same direction, tilting same direction, and this one is two. Can you see that? Okay. So, whenever you have this, this and that one meet each other, you have uh, three different types of domain wars. Okay. These are domain wars, it's between the two different types of domains and the boundaries, as I said, in the, uh, this, the uh, autonomic system, like atrium bearing carbon oxide, and this type of position sitting this way and that way, okay, it's different, this is the surface of the film, this way and that way, between those two, and you have a boundaries, and middle plane, the twin boundaries, same way you have this kind of boundaries. 
for these boundaries because the nature of these two and these two and these two so we call 71 degree domain wall 109 domain wall 180 degree domain wall we have three different types of domain walls okay you get it so there are three domain walls and then these domain walls very clearly seen in this kind of microstructure so most of work I mean, all this the previous work okay just grow it Okay, just the same kind of technique I mentioned in the beginning of it, just spot training or POD, and make a target, and get the substrate. Lattice mismatch, mismatch substrate, like a strontium titanium whatever substrate, and then you deposit it, you end up in this kind of structure. And this is a piezoelectric image, a PFM image, you have this and that, you have four many different contrasts, and the different, different contrasts correspond to different domains. And the region's boundaries is between those these boundaries. Okay? So that means there's a lot of complexity issue. I mean, if you look at the cross-section of micrograph, in cross-section micrograph, you see that 45 degree is kind of domain wall, which is a 71 degree domain wall. If this is a 70, so like a 45 degree. Okay? The domain wall looks like that. And then the domain wall is a slanted domain wall. But some domain wall is a vertical domain wall here. The vertical domain wall, you see something. That is this kind of domain wall, we call 109 domain walls. Depending on what types of R1, R2, or R1, R4, what kind of combination of the, these domains. Okay? And then you have this kind of domain wall. When you switch it, each component behaves differently, very hard to know what's going on. And then this is a bismuth ferrite, but when you lay down ferromagnetic layer like cobalt layer, change, trying to exchange coupling, how do you know? How can you really happening? What exactly happening? Underlying and coupling all this mechanism, very hard. So now, I think the four elastic variants and including two more additional ferroelectric domain. So you have a total four, four, four elastic ferroelastic variant, eight ferroelectric variants. We have a total two main. Then ideally, you want this. Can you make, get it the old domain walls, make a single monodomain bismuth ferrite, and monomer with no domain walls? That means all the switching is deterministic and then intrinsic exchange coupling between bismuth ferrite and ferromagnetic layer we can study and then use other types of sub characterization technique and then synchrotron based MOC measurement, a synchrotron based a PIN measurement and MOC measurement, all these things you don't have to worry about different regions and, and then domain wall contribution. So, this is something very simple approach everybody can think of and how can you do that? That's uh, something you want to do. So we learned this one in very early stage. We had a very similar problem, not like this, and then orthorhombic system. Okay. As I said, how can you make this one to this one? Can you break this uh, these things from this one, that one, can you make everything this one? Okay? How can you do that? This way to that way, I want to make a hundred percent that way. What is the simple way you can imagine is breaking this variation to only one? Anybody has an idea? Apply a stronger magnetic field. Strong magnetic field? Okay, so magnetic fields at gross temperature, very high gross temperature, like a 500, 600 degrees C. How magnetic field coupled with the alignment of the disk domain or domains? That will help to, in, uh, that will help to grow in magnetic field direction of all the domains. Okay, so probably you can align magnetic domains using magnetic field. Okay, like uh, people grow some anti-ferrogenic material using or ferromagnetic material 
using magnetic field, they align the magnetic domains. But magnetic domains is, is different things, a structural domain. This is a structural domain, okay? also a big and then, and then uh, the uh, wrong wear domain. So you have to think about another degree of freedom, another approach, rather than just magnetic field. Magnetic field doesn't work on that way. It works for magnetic materials. Magnetic, ferromagnetic domains can be aligned at room temperature. It doesn't work at very high temperature because above QE temperature, it doesn't work. Proper substrate too. So what kind of proper substrate do you do? One one orientation substrate. Okay. So one one on also a substrate. Okay, you're, you're getting close. One one on substrate. But when you grow one one on substrate, your film grow one one on direction. So that means you you want to one zero zero direction, not one 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 direct one one oh direction. You want to grow one zero zero direction. Okay, so getting close. You know, to do that, you have a problem of this substrate, the cubic, what you're using. The cubic substrate, like most of the people use a strontium titanate substrate as a sub cubic material. In cubic substrate, you look at the cubic four-fold symmetry. Cubic substrate four-fold symmetry. It looks like a, this direction and that direction is equivalent. But the film you're growing is two-fold symmetry. This way and that way different. That means you have to break the symmetry of the substrate. How can you break the symmetry of substrate? Because you have a cubic okay, looking top, looks like everything cubic, it's this direction and that's equivalent. So that means when tr trying to lay down this orthorhombic layer on top, this way and that way, I don't feel any difference. So I can go whatever right direction I want to go. Some direction grow that way. Some direction laid down that way because a nucleation, nucleation of different nuclei is not. Okay, so that means this way and that way you can have multiple domains. So you have to break the symmetry. How can you break the symmetry of this one? Temperature? Using template. Template? Any other idea? Do you think the surface of the substrate is perfectly, perfectly flat? Do you think it's perfectly flat? No, it's not perfectly flat. Some features on the surface. So, <clears throat> for example, strontium ruthenate, the orthorhombic structure inside of the subunit cell, looks like a cubic, but this is this direction and that direction is not equivalent because of the C direction and then this uh, AB direction, and then due to this octreter rotation. So <clears throat> even though this one looks like a pseudo-cubic, <coughs> this one and that one are equivalent. So how do you make this one and then on the surface? <coughs> the trick is very simple. Look at the surface. The surface has the steps. The the surface of the substrate, when you heat it up high temperature, the surface is forming some steps. The steps here can have different way of making steps. And steps has either long direction of one or direction, or another one or direction, because of the step formation is due to surface energy. You have a low surface energy. We want to have a large area. You want to be lowest surface energy plane. Okay? So that's why when you grow rock salt crystals, your rock salt, like a salt crystal, you eat salt, what kind of shape of salt crystal come out? Cube shape type of thing, right? Salt crystal, when you grow this, like a very flat facet, you can see the salt. Anybody seen the salt crystal? Flat? When you when you have a salt like a saturated salt, salt water at high temperature and cool down slowly or hit it, you can make a very tiny salt crystal and crystals form the facet. So that facet is a low surface energy plane. And you have a facet here, the so 100 is a low surface energy plane. And so this is a 100 and this 100 is 100 plane. But 
depending on how you prepare the substrate, like you mentioned the 110. 110 is a surface step. It's not like this surface. It's a much higher miscut. So that means when you have this surface here, and then uh, your surface is flat, but when you make this one surface a little bit slanted, okay, like angle, a little bit of angle, then you call this miscut. They're not perfectly parallel to the surface plane. It's not perfectly parallel to the uh, crystallography, crystallography plane. It's off from the crystal plane, very small angle, not very high angle. The 110 one you measure is 45 degree. 45 degree, if you 45 degree too much, then grow 45 direction, one one direction. But you don't want to go that high. Just very small enough to break the symmetry. And then your nucleus of this one, I feel the difference between them and that one. Okay? I feel the difference, this and that one, and avoid this nucleation, this terrace length not too long. Because uh, you want to nucleate here, and then uh, you want to fill fill the substrate substrate edge. So, when you do this orthorhombic substrate, this kind of structure, the possible lay down on top is this six possible orientation. Okay, this six, six possible orientation on this, and then you can break this one to a single one by doing particular miscut. But miscut direction is one zero zero direction. And then make remove all these things, pretty much everything flat like this. Just a single step. Just a only line. Okay. Make a lines and then you feel everything laid down one way. Okay? So that is something did that in the past in the past, doing this kind of low angle, like maybe 2 to 3 degrees, it's not like 45 degrees, very low angle, but if it's an actual nuclei, it feels the difference and grow the single chromate. So, but this one, at the time, the miscut orientation, this one is a beta angle, and we expect this, like the beta equals 0 means everything is miscut is along, along that direction, so only this kind of step doesn't exist, only this step so exists. So that everything aligned one direction. Okay, this is an orthorhombic system of strong single thing. But as I said, in this spherite, and this system doesn't have the same kind of symmetry. This orthorhombic symmetry is so not orthorhombic symmetry, it's a rhomboidal symmetry along the one one direction. So when you look at actual schematics of domain selection rule, when you have a no miscut or no symmetry breaking and then these four different variants can you create anywhere whatever you want <coughs> so which means you end up complexity of this possible domain you end up this kind of complex structure but you use the same kind of approach the miscut angle along the one zero direction this along that direction you see, this is what I've said the strong gluten this one works beautifully well for this orthorhombic system, but in rhomboidal system, is a polarization direction or elastic distortion is rhomboidal along the diagonal direction one one oh one one one, and then you need miscut along the one one zero direction. It's a forty five degree, and then pointing forty five degree along that direction, and the selection is much easier to form. A single domain in one barrier system. So this is a hypothesis. Okay? The hypothesis based on these two previous experience, previous our our work, and you might be able to do perfect single domain using different direction of miscut rather than one zero zero miscut creating line type of steps or along the one one oh it's a, like a zigzag type of okay, zigzag type of surface, which means I want to align along the diagonal direction 45. And then if you do that, you might be able to do everything this direction. Maybe you can do 
single domain. Okay? But in another thing you can play here is your federal elective domain is can be down or can be up. You can do two possibilities. But this one is easy to solve. The federal electric domain, federal electric direction polarization has to be screened. The screening can be done free electrons or like a electrons screening. So you have a bottom electrode, you have a strontium ruthenate electrode, very, very conductive electrode, can screen the polarization, so prefer to have federal electric domain <coughs> or down polarization direction. Down direction. So this down and up is easily to do that, but elastic domain, federal elastic domain, you have to use this kind of trick. Okay? So this is a hypothesis. Do you think it works? That's why I'm explaining it. It works. <laughs> okay, so when you grow this material and without doing anything, you see that multi domains lots of multi-domains, and then you look at the AFM images, and scale of this, you see that like a mountain and rocks, very, very rough. And this is a, most of the people, previously we do that, and then this is a sample they study, and then measure things, and that's what they did. But you have a lot of domain boundaries I didn't show here, but this cut along the 100 direction, in this approach, and surface, rock smoother, you see that some kind of steps and then surface rough. But doing along the one one direction, with the surface a lot smoother, this is all the steps. You can see all the steps. Can you see that steps? This very simple trick just to make a substrate just a few degrees, four degrees along the one one direction, and then you get this one. But it's only surface. Yesterday we learned this progress in the lab. Can you do this in the lab before the living method or it's available in the market? Say again. Can we do this method in the subject in the lab or it is available in the market? In the market. In the market. But you have to specify specify your miscut. And I can explain that what I did in the past. When I did the experiment, this one is done one year, 1997. It was many years ago. Yeah, this, this. At the time, you cannot get those substrates. The problem is, substrate vendor at the time, just the selling, okay, this is something for well, your research may help, so I can tell you my, some, my experience. 1997, I think I started this experiment, probably 1997, which means back to a few years before then, we start thinking about this. And then, uh, when you order some software at the time, the software vendor, no demand, no demands of MISCA at the time. No one really needs any MISCA. In order to get this MISCA, your software vendor orient your single crystal in x-ray diffractometer. You align it and you have the slices, slices of rate and alignment within very precise. You think about like a one degree alignment of X-ray. You think single crystal software vendor, and there is is not that easy. Okay. So at the time, just align it, slice it, and sell it. Everybody happy with that. No one is really need specific specification of miscut or miscut direction or anything. They just get it. So when it is original work we did, software vendor, when I asked, they don't know how to do it. So what I did is buy 300, 400 software. You have a lot of software. And then each substrate, we measure this. The way of measuring the miscut angle is we actually have a technique. I think other people it, it, it help. Using the laser, the laser beam, and X-ray diffraction, with a dose tube. And then, uh, maybe hard to explain this by just by hand like this. This laser beam reflection 
is coming from the surface. Do you understand that? Okay, just simply look at this one. When I reflect this, it's a reflection of this beam. Can you see that reflection? Okay, not, not, I think that not, it's a good meter. So this laser beam uses the helium neon laser, okay, red laser, reflect the surface and reflect it, I can see the spot over there. That is coming from the surface. Okay? So I know what is the surface plane reflecting. But actual refraction is not surface. Actual refraction coming from what? Crystallographic plane. Do, do you understand that? The crystal plane and the surface plane is not the same. So that means you have certain things you can relationship you know and you rotate this then your discrepancy of this and the diffraction thing and you have, when you rotate the phi angle, phi rotation then what happens is, is we align the phi or axis what you want this circle, reflection circle, circling around like this circle that bigger which means mid-square angle big Circle small, it's going to angle small, no, no like a circle, just the one spot stays, perfectly stays same, that means it's going to angle zero. Do you understand? Do you understand this very simple one? But you have to, you have to do something more complicated in this one, but I just simple concept, is this a large miscut, small miscut, and zero miscut, Why rotating phi angle. Remember yesterday I said the phi angle, phi rotation? And then when you do that, you know what is the surface of the plane, which direction, one zero zero directions. When you align your sample, one oh one zero zero with respect to this uh, alignment of the sample, we know which that direction is. So from this rotation thing, we know which direction is miscal angle in the sample. Okay? I think I need to sit down and then explain this, but I think without drawing something this way. It takes time. Each sample alignment measurement takes time because align it and doing this one, we have in our lab, in the, in the wall, we have lots of papers in the wall. And you just marker and then draw the line and measure this, which direction, and this kind of angle. So we have to select a few hundred substrates, select all of them. And we actually selected this one, this cut angle, this angle, and this direction, and this one, and that direction selected. We only use few substrate from hundreds of substrate. And then that belongs to belongs to certain beta angle, certain alpha angle, and we actually did that. And then looking at at the time, changing the beta angle a higher, higher beta angle called 45 degree, and you get single domain to do two domain. Because of, you have a symmetry breaking, this one and that one prefer both ways because of your 45 degree. Your steps that direction, your steps going that direction, you can go that way, you can go there, you can go both ways. So that's why you vary the beta angle, and then you have a two. You have an alpha angle, which is a dismissal angle, can also variation too. But now, I think uh, because of this miscut plays a role, you can order the substrate. Okay, I need miscut angle, this angle, and miscut direction, that angle. You can specify those things. So substrate vendor can measure and then provide that one variable. And we have to specify what the error bar. What is the variation of it? Like uh, they usually 4 degree plus minus 0.3 degree or 0.5 degree or well, you want to ask a 0.01 degree, I mean, you ask a much tighter orientation, they charge more. Sometimes you pay more the labor than substrate. But I want to, for example, something like we do certain two-dimensional electron gas work. You ask a orientation very tight, 0 0.08 to point. Point, uh, one to five or something. Very tight orientation. That means if you have those kind of tight orientation and tight miscut, then you can actually know what the terrace length. The terrace length, you mean that this length of terrace? This terrace length 
depending on this corner angle. This curve get bigger and bigger, then these lengths get shorter and shorter. And the this corner angle is very small, terrace length is very long. When the terrace lengths get longer, then more likely you can nucleate nuclei on top of this because surface diffusion is slow before you reach the edge here and nucleate on the surface. Okay, so it's a more practical issue, but I think, uh, yeah, this uh, now we can buy, no problem. But I mean, 1995, but 20 years ago, and they didn't know how to do it, so we have to select it. But sometimes, when you do some new experiment, you have to be something not available, which means you have to make your own way to make those experiments. Maybe sometimes vendor cannot do it. One way we could do it at the time, we, we, if the substrate doesn't have variation, then I had to do, use a different ways you can make this one. You can make a wedge, wedge slide, wedge, wedge grinding. Do you know what you're grinding? So your substrate and something underneath stick in, very tiny, thin slice, then you can a little bit, then you can flatten grinding, then you can do that too. So you get many ways you can do it. But I didn't do that way. That I just selected multiple software because uh, that is an easier way to do that. So you have this kind of very nice smooth surface. This is multiplayer maintained. And then this one, this AFM image, is not BFO. This one is strontium ruthenate and BFO, this double layer. So strontium ruthenate grow on top, then you grow on top of it, this one's very maintained. And then strontium ruthenate underneath, shape structure maintained, and maybe underneath of strontium ruthenate is not the perfect model domain. But the structural domain on top of this is a mono domain. So when you look at this one, okay, this is RSM response space mapping yesterday, and you can actually see that this is a K or same thing H, okay, this H, and this L, okay. Remember yesterday, H or L, we have seen it. So this along that direction is a scanning along that direction. You actually look at peak, peak, and peak, and peak, right? So we just look at X-ray diffraction without RSM. You scan it along that direction, along that direction. Maybe you miss this peak. Okay, you only draw the line here, and you just look at the shoulder. You look at this measurement, time slay, and you see the only broad peaks like here. So in order to look at this domain structure, <coughs> you have to look at mapping. In your mapping, you have one, two, three, you have a multiple domain, four domains can be seen, and then the very complex one. And here, you have two domains, the majority domain is R1 domain, but you have a two domains. For your mono domain, you can get a single domain. So we have domain selection is coming from this cut. You can only see single domain rather than multiple domain. And this is RSM data. And from this, you know which one is which. But actually AFM image, a PFM image, you see that four different contrasts to two different contrasts as in one contrast. So that means you have a perfectly one domain and no other domains of value. So that means you have a perfect mono domain, then you can lay down device anywhere, or you can measure the probing whole thing, I measure the same properties. You measure this one whole thing, like when you pin measurement, only any measurement of the probing this whole thing, and this one responds, and this one responds, or average it out. So you do not know which one is really contributing this. So this is a single mono domain configuration, but TM shows the same thing. You have a multiple way of verification. And you have a four variants. You have only 45D. Can you see that? Okay. There's 71 domain wall. 
we have only one domain and then the two variants and here no variance so now I think we have original hypothesis making this variance monodomain if domain engineering is very simple trick simple way is symmetry breaking of the substrate and uh, you can do that another way you can do it is somebody said as like I said a substrate but this one is a cubic substrate but you another way you can do it using orthorhombic substrate or like a symmetry of lower symmetry substrate use a lower symmetry substrate you easily it's not the surface step breaking the symmetry but actual crystallographic actual distortion break the symmetry can grow more than me too so for example strontium luthanate as I mentioned already here is strontium luthanate if you use orthrhombic substrate like a scandate or a neodymium gallate type of the orthrhombic substrate with the same kind of uh, space group then you don't have to do miscut you just grow it you grow monodomain perfect monodomain forms and then on top of those things but you have a miscut and your lattice mismatch is bigger. So that's why strontium luthanate and neodymium gallate, because lattice mismatch is huge, even though there's an orthonomic substrate, same symmetry. So you have to deal with is what is the lattice mismatch and then your symmetry, and you have to work those things. So you have a freedom of this. Either you can use a symmetry of substrate, or you can surface, actually miscut, surface steps. So you can do both ways. Any questions so far here, up to here? So when you're doing this in monodomain, you're confirming this is simply, oh, sorry. So when you do this, the way you can confirm outer plane and in plane mapping is that both in plane and out of plane because the wrong radial direction polarization is pointing like a 54.7 54 degree here. So you know you know do that, you can have a component of this component or this component, you can measure both. So it's like your piezo magnetic piezo measurement, you can do lateral or out of plane, you can measure both of them by PFM. So this so you can image it, you can do this you can do this. So you have to do both ways. For example, you have this one or you have that one. Okay, you have two different possibilities. And when you measure this outer plane, it looks the same. Because outer component is one. You, you understand that? So let's see. You have polarization in two, two different domains. I have two different domains. This domain and this domain. You measure the outer plane component, polarization component. And this component and that component of outer plane is same. So that means you cannot distinguish it. So we have to measure outer plane component first. Then you measure the in-plane component, whether this one or that one is either this one, out in-plane component this one, or this one. You have two different components, right? So that is what confirmation here, in-plane, outer plane, shows outer plane everything down, in-plane everything one direction. Okay, that's what we do. Okay, so now we complain this, but more surprisingly, when you measure the polarization switching, the variant, four variants one, it's like four different things, you see polarization is, looks like very leaky. Okay, very leaky, and then your polarization is low, and then this is a leaky behavior, and a lot of bad behavior. This is due to domain walls. The domain walls are very leaky. That's a problem. You have two variants. Two variants, a, red, a blue one. Okay? And then red one is a single variant. And those two, it's not no leakage at all. No leakage and polarization value is comparable, about the same. So this one tells what? And also, when you look at the leakage, Four variants, leakage is roughly here, here to here, is roughly 
one, two, and three order of magnitude higher leakage. That means your current like leak is so badly, so you cannot really measure it. That's why early stage people make this a BF4 and the measuring they have to go 77 Kelvin low temperature to measure the polarization because your leakage is so bad and you cannot measure room temperature. The problem is at the time is the leakage is coming from these domain walls. So in these two monodomain and then two variants, leakage is a lot lower and then its monodomain is significantly lower than this one. And this one actually tells us what the mechanism of leakage. You have a domain walls, this kind of domain wall, 71 degree domain wall, which is it only does exist, this, this kind of 70 domain wall, it does exist in this kind of two variant system, this is a two variant system. And then this 90 domain wall, this kind of vertical domain wall, 109 domain wall, is coming from this one. Okay? And then you can see this domain wall leakage is huge and this domain wall leakage is very small. So this is fundamentally, you know, what the contribution of different domain wall, but you made very simple way of making single domain. Okay? So that is something you can do a very simple way to do. But this mono domain allows us to do a lot of interesting studies because we are ready to go using mono domain. You can do fatigue study and you can switching study, you can do magnetoelectric coupling study, you can do pin measurement in synchrotron. And then because of your pin, your, your pin is a, the the um, the, the uh, photoelectron uh, photo emission electron microscope, <coughs> and that is actual size of your imaging area is like a hundred microns was that range, and hundred micron area you don't want to have multiple domain. You have single domain. That means you image those things like a spin spin structures and then your ferromagnetic structures, you do that, you want to have a single domain. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, the other things about the, how we use this monodomain to study other types of properties and phenomena in magnetic coupling. And then after break, so I'd like to invite some questions. Sure. So what, uh, how do you measure this 71 degree domain wall and what is the angle of this? Okay. Wall? It's not the measurement angle. So this angle is a geometrically, you know, which direction is 71 domain wall. And then the reason why we call 71 degree domain wall is when you look at rhomboidal, rhomboidal parasitic domain region, and between those two polarization angle, the 71 degree domain. 71 degree, and 109 is, okay, so I have to draw something, because 71 is along the 110. This one, okay, you have two different, this one, and that one, this angle, 71, okay? And then other one, this one to that one is 109, and this one to that one, 180. So this, the, 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 the angle we are talking about is not measurement of it, it's actually looking at the possible combination of this polarization and other polarization, that angle relationship is 71 if it is a bulk case. But if a strain, some kind of strain, then 71 can be 69 degree or something. But in the bulk case, we call this one, the, look at the, just to draw the cube, I'll, I'll draw it later. We have another figure here, let me show you. 71 is coming from, it's another 111, to just move another 111. That's, this is 71. But this 1112, another here, that's 109. This is 180. So you have a three here. Yeah, structure thing. Yeah, you can actually see. I, I'll show you that the next one uh, after break. Uh, I'll show you that. Yeah. You said in case of the uh, multi domain structures, the low temperature measurement shows less decay. Because uh, um, this uh, bismuth ferrite itself is band gap is relatively low, like a two point something EV. And then the, the creating a lot of charge carriers inside here is coming from many different reasons. 
But the domain wall region is a lot of breaking bonds, and there's a lot of defects, and then the chemistry is not very good. For example, you have some um, like a bismuth deficiency or something at the in, at the domain walls, and then uh, so when you usually you freeze all the carriers when you go low temperature, when you freeze the carriers, and that's why you can measure low temperature. When you go high temperature, you have uh, more carriers comes because the gap is low, especially maybe. Is a near the domain wall region, even gap is low, even lower. That's why it created. I think, that, I think those things are actually calculation also done too. What the domain wall region, what is the actual band structure is. I think that kind of things like Nicola Stalin's group and they have done this kind of thing. Is it clear? Domain walls, domain engineering? But this is a one way of. It's the synthesis of materials. And then not all the materials are the same. But a lot of materials, complex oxide or inorganic materials, not cubic. Not everything cubic. Sometimes uh, hexagonal, sometimes orthorhombic, sometimes wrong hydro. And you have a lot of different structures. And how you can engineer to make your materials for the model system to study. And then this is one of the tricks. But I think uh, this is not all. But we may have some other type of uh, creative idea can, can do it. But I just give one example. And then when I do this, using this technique, and then uh, uh, we have studied next, I mean, I'm going to talk about and this exchange coupling and the magnetic uh, electric coupling. I, I'll talk about this. But uh, also I'm going to talk about uh, this is fundamental issue of, of this uh, multiferrics is the retention and then uh, actual reliability of the fatigue. You know what the fatigue is? And the study of fatigue, I'll show you, is a very interesting way you can actually study what is the origin of fatigue of different orientations. So I'll talk about maybe after the after break. Yes? Okay. So if you if you look at the, I mean, this is uh, something I skip quickly. If you know the what is the actual distortion, what is distortion, and then you actually predict which domain forms what angle and what direction. So you have a variation of this. For example, you have variation around the hydro going that direction, that direction, and that direction, and that direction. You pick, you pick one reflection, your ears, which can pick all of those, and it, which contains H, K, L, certain component. And then when you do that, because uh, due to this uh, different orientation distortion, and uh, your location of this broadcast space, and then shows the different regions. So that requires a little bit of the more, more explanation. But it's not, yesterday I explained only like a coherent, incoherent, rocking curve, all these things. But you can see all possible domains in the single mapping. So which one you look at? And that's a lot more explanation. But I can show you not only this, like a, like a um, rhomboidal system and tetragonal system, you mix together, then you can distinguish them. I think those are RSM data, you have to little more time to digest it. But you also need the digesting at the same time. You have to sit down and doing your own experiment in your next ray machine. And uh, what you do is usually when you do this RSM, not just doing it, you actually create your some kind of spreadsheet. The spreadsheet and then where you can actually see these reflections. And then looks very simple, RSM like scanning everything. And sometimes the software do all these things. But, but the sometimes the beyond the soft, uh, software, you want to know is, is, is it actually a diffraction scan, actually scan. It's not just a scan, it's like a real space angular scan. In, in, the, in the command you are giving it, it's angle scan, right? Theta is from one angle to one angle. And chi, what angle to what angle? It's an angle scan. It's not 
Ms. Poga's active scam. And then in order to real states like Angostan, you convert it to Ms. Poga's states, you plan it. Or computer software is helps to data acquisition like this. Okay, I want to do this mapping this region and computer figure it out what angle scan they want to do. Okay, so that's something we can do both ways. Some X-ray factometer come with this kind of complete package of software. Sometimes you don't have one, but you have to manually do it and scan it. You get plotted that way. Okay, so for example, in bismuth ferrite here, when you grow extremely ultra thin films, ultra thin, very, very thin layer, then substrate, clamping substrate, actually hold it, it goes to tetragonal. Okay, it's tetragonal domain, ultra thin, because strain is huge, right? Strain is huge, and then it, it actually prevents formation of wrong middle. It's like a like a tetragonal. It, in true sense, it's not tetragonal. It's monoclinic. It's a little bit of distortion. It's, you can create monodomain tetragonal, ultra thin. It's very small. And some other work like a ultra thin region, very large lead asymmetric substrate like a lanthanum aluminate, and I think Ramesh is grouped it that way. And when you grow very thin, then they can see tetragonal domain, rhombohedral domain mixture, very thin region. They have seen that one too. So the domains is domain formation is not only single variables. Domain formation depending on also lattice mismatch. Your lattice mismatch is huge and then the thickness is very thin, then you create new domains, which is rhomboidal domain to tetragonal domain, or tetragonal domain, rhomboidal domain mixture. So you have all these things can happen. But I just give one example is I'm more interested in at the time is making single domain is measurable single domain. This one works single domain up to one micron. Up to most of the experiment we did here is I have to switch it. If the thickness is only like a one nanometer, one nanometer you cannot switch it. The leakage is so bad. So we cannot switch it. So minimum thickness we need maybe 100 angstrom or 150 angstrom, uh, 150 nanometers, like a, over 1,000 angstrom to, to measure this. Because we have to switch, switch the polarization. At the same time, we want to measure the magnetic characteristics because of the, that's the magnetic coupling, right? So you know to make this one thick enough, the growth thicken it up like a very thin tube. Oh, very thick, like 150 nanometer to about what you study, 800 nanometer, and all this one grow the monodomain. But even though it's a monodomain, 150 nanometer is a partially strain relaxed, and 600 domain angstrom, a uh, 600 nanometer one, almost relaxed. So some range of relaxation from thin to thick, even though it's all monodomain. So you can actually study the strain dependent as well. Any more questions? <coughs> All right, let's take a break and then I'll come back and then how we use the, these domains to actually study other types of fatigue and then uh, magnetic coupling in this uh, second session. Okay. We'll talk about this uh, using this monodomain and then uh, two fundamental device performance characteristics um, in the BFO. And then first one is the retention, and the other one is the fatigue. I think those two are uh, one of, uh, two of the very important reliability and uh, the issue of the ferroelectrics. So the retention is, is reductive with time. When you switch the polarization in the ferroelectric or multiferric system, how long does it last? without losing the information, okay? So when you have a writing, uh, like a ferroelectric memories, and then whatever, smart card and computers, you actually put some information, and immediately you lose the information, then that's not useful. So one of the important things we found 
It's 71 degree switching. Okay, this is what I'm going to show you next slide. And then this one, reliability of this one, few hours, and then you lose the information. Okay, this is a fundamental issue, especially if your device gets smaller and smaller. If a large device doesn't have this problem, but the smaller device, this problem is more severe. Okay? So, look at issue here. 71 degree switching is basically these two, the 71 degree switching, look at this one. One, okay, this is one position here, R1 position, and then another R1 position is that direction, the 70 degree switching. From here to here is 70 degree switching. Okay? Can you see that? This one down direction to up direction, angle between this one to that one, that's 71 degree. Okay? So the corner, the position of the corner of the, when you apply electric field, top electrode and bottom electrodes, okay, so you're switching electric field down to up. Then you have a two different pathway to get switch. One way, simply it's the shortest way to go from here to here. Can you see that one? Okay, from here to here, the 71 degree switching, that is well known. <clears throat> Another way you can have switching is go here, this one and that one is equivalent going to 180 degree switching, going to that direction. Okay? So you have this one and that one, two possibilities, but in the elastically, we look at the actual elastic configuration is constrained, and this is a very unstable. Okay? And this is more stable than this one, this is more unstable. So look at this one. We have a before switching of everywhere, mono domain, looks like everything pointing downward. But when you switch a semi-dual switching, certain of those going to other direction is up. So look at this one and that one. This is a 71 degree switching. Look at this one. And this one and that one. And creating rhomboidal distortion this way to this way. So that's why you get this kind of region. You have a lot of energy, is elastic energy build up here. So that is very unstable. So 180 switching is rather than this configuration, you want to be that way, but this one still satisfy propagation is upward, but you're elastically not as not as bad as this. So that's why this before switching everything downward, and then in during the serial switching, it's a propagation is down to up, but this is a not very stable then you go this direction is easier. So the pathway here, 180 switching is, is the lowest energy, it's like, like the same as this. This one and that one is same, almost same energy state. But in between, you have a 70 switching go to this state. Okay, this state. And over time, this one goes to here. Because initially, this one to this state consume a lot more energy than two-step process. Okay? So this is the actual switching process, a two-step process. When you, read, when you read a lot of papers about bismuth ferrite, they said 180 switching, 71 degree switching, they have a lot of those words in there. And then one paper I show you, Nature Papers, that uh, Ramesh is going mention, they said it's a, that 180 switching, that's the one of the reasons they have a magnetic coupling, they have some, some papers about that. So you have this one is 71, this is 180, but energetically, this one and that one looks very similar, so energetically low, but does not go from here to here directly. You go step, and then from this step to this step, the two-step process. So initially what I draw here, you're from here to relaxation here, is, is coming this one is very unstable. You don't want to be that way. That's why you go that state. Okay? That's a losing the, uh, the, this kind of state. So, 70 state is low activation energy, but not stable. 
have one head switching, high activation is stable. So the way it actually go in the process is driven by external field go here, and with time, with time we lose the information by going to here. Okay, so you have one go here and later go back here. So so initially, in order to really understand this, making the electrode is large electrode and smaller electrode, you compare this because you have volume to like the interfacial interfacial area when divided by the volume. It's a smaller device, you have a lot more interfacial energy than volume energy, right? So that means this one is a is an energy due to some kind of elastic constraint is not likely severe, but when it's smaller and smaller, you have a much more serious problem. So what we did here is using large electrode and small electrode and compare these two, see how this thing happened. So we used to 71 degree switching, for example, and large electrode, okay, like a platinum electrode, and then you switch it initially, initially everything like this. Okay, initially like this, and but maybe half of it, okay, in the regions half of it, is a put down the platinum electrode and switch this one to 70 million degree switching up. Okay? You apply electric field from here, so you can switch that way. Okay? You switch this way, this one. 70 degree switching, this region, you don't have an electrode, stays the same. But only this region switch up. So when you look at X-ray refraction of these regions, okay, whole thing, initially monodomain, when you switch this, you start to see two domains. Can you see that? You can see the two. So this one is coming from this piece, this one coming from this piece. Okay? So you have clearly see these two from this. And then, at the same time, you can do polarization switching by electric field, the PFM. Okay. The PFM measurement, you look at these regions, small area scan, and then you switch this region, okay, this three region, and what happened? Okay. Monitoring the area of several switching area with time. Okay. So this one, X-ray diffraction work, you cannot do time de time dependence not easily because of this request scan takes time. So we, you actually switch that way, you take it, measure it, but during the measurement time scan, like of many hours a day, and it never changed. But in the PFM measurement, you have to switch it initially like this, and then you just go away, gradually, you have changed this in-plane scan, in-plane measurement, and the changes. Out of plane the same, but in-plane measurement, it changes like this. So, side dependence is 70 or switching. In this one, 200 micron by 700 micron, large area, and when you measure the data point, it's basically no change. Stay the same. Because your area, interfacial area is small, and then your volume is big. So, but when you go smaller scan, smaller device, it dies very quickly. And then you, you one micron even faster. And the 0.5 micron is faster. It's a very small. And then this one, the simulation itself is consistent with the actual experimental data. So this is experimental data, the pink spot, and the red one, and then this uh, green one, and black one. You write the domain a different size and watch it what fraction actually stays. You can do that. So you can clearly see that very strong size dependence. So we lose the information in a few hours in micron size cells. So what happened is, as the grown state and 71 switching, and this one elastically in this region, very, very unstable. So what happened is, is a large device not an issue, but smaller device has a problem. So, you know, to overcome this problem, okay, let's remove the elastic constraint outside, 
isolated, okay, make isolated island, then you remove all the outside stuff, and then you write the domain here, what happened? That means you don't have is in the regions outside does not affect elastic boundary condition. So when you do that, and then the three by three micron here, and then this one, the, the isolated island is basically flat, and then this constrained one is like this. So that means you understand that this elastic constraint is an issue. So you can overcome, overcome this this 71 degree switching and then making this isolated island. This is one of the demonstration. It's not clear mm -hmm. that we can make all the island is a pillar structure to do that. And then that's another issue. But at least we understand that the switching is coming from two-step switching. And that's what happens. So I'm going to talk about next one is fatigue issue, which is you switch back and forth multiple times and you lose the information. Okay? So that's a reality issue with cycles. So when you have this initially, is some of them is no fatigue, some of them is fatigue. And then how you study the fatigue in this business ferry system. And then you look at the operation fatigue, is this a one 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 business ferry has initially you have this kind of large polarization, but over time you get this kind of reduced polarization. So that means it get loose and loose, and eventually you get all the information loose. So why this thing happen? Okay, why this thing happen? Switching along the one 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 direction because this is a one 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 oriented film. I did talk about it, but one 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 switching is one one one. Then you have rhombohedral or line rhombohedral down this way rather than one zero zero. And when you switch that way, it dies very quickly. And if you look at this one by actual refraction, 111 one, one, ferrite initially like this, switch many, many cycles. After many cycles, I see something very strange thing happen. Okay? Switch this way, okay, from here to here, 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 many times cycle. And then initially, you have only this one and that one, which is that one. But after cycling, I see something strange. And this one, you can really identify R2, R3, R4, rather than pointing down something intermediate. So what they mean is, when you switch this from here to here, there's an intermediate state from here to here. Okay, because of this rhomboidal nature, this is not only BF4, other rhomboidal system <coughs> switching is that way. So here, 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 and here. So it's, it's not like a deterministic one, two, back and forth. We'd, most of people thought all the switching that way. Okay, simple, back and forth. That's what people believe. But this data tells this one doesn't happen. This one happen is the intermediate state, this, 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 this. Okay? So, somehow, switch many times this, 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 this. Some of them stuck here. Okay? Some of them stuck here, doesn't go all the way here. So why it stuck here, or stuck here, and doesn't go that way? Okay? So this one tells certain of those end up intermediate stage. You go intermediate stage, and then your projection you want to go from to here, everything you want to go here, stuck here, then you reduce the projection. Because everything I want to go, everything here, but this one, the opposite direction, and reduce it. Or you want to go everything here, but some of them end up here, this component here, not as big as the full component is, right? Okay. So that is something hypothesis here, we, we see that, oh, I think something new happened, and that is the reason for, reason for is reduced, that's what you can think of. How this thing happened, and then you look at this very careful measurement of PFM measurement, really it happened, because when you do this measurement, the fatigue measurement, okay, this thing, can you really see this one during the switching? 
So we did is outer plane and inner plane. Initially, you have a, everything here and here. Okay. So that means from this measurement, you have a zero inner plane component. Can you see that? Everything is down. There's no inner plane component. So that means the contrast in plane is nothing. But in the outer plane in plane component, after switching, you see that some of them is looks very strange. So which means when you switch outer plane, some of them is like a, everything I switch that way. Well, it looks like a, some of the components down. But it's not that way because of looking at in plane, the correlation of the in plane here, somehow if down is that kind of down rather than this kind of down. So that is the region of your problem. So to mapping out this region using in plane and relationship all these things and then image of optical micro image, in plane image, out of plane image, and you can actually determine all the domains, which domains is. So you can add this one so you can tell certain regions of domain here, domain words, you can identify from this uh, the in plane direction, which direction in plane pointing, which direction is pointing out of plane, you can relationship all find out. You can find certain regions, this kind of domain, certain regions, this kind of domain, and certain regions, this domain, certain domain. So we have certain of them, this, certain of them, you can identify, not only this one. Okay, so that means you find certain regions, you find the regions head to head or tail to tail, which means you head to head, and then you head to head, you can have charge domain wall because you have both a head to head, so they're energetically very uh, unfavorable. So in order to reduce this, your oxygen vacancy can go there, pin the domain because oxygen vacancy go and stabilize in this region. So oxygen vacancy goes in and pin the domain. And once you pin the domain wall, I'm ha very happy that way. So I'm very happy with the, something oxygen vacancy pin it. I don't want to move. So that can be stuck there and no more move. So that's why you have these regions of this can be stuck, like initially down, up, but you have an intermediate stage, you have a this kind of stage, this kind of stage, but you have multiple of those forming the head to head, and then you get some kind of domain wall and stuck it here and never go to polarization switching. Okay, that is one way of higher chance of formation of child domain wall during the switching, and that's what happened. That's a one, one, one. Good. But if you have 71 degree switching, you don't have those kind of process. Because in one, 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 one case, go here, 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 and here. But the 71 is no other intermediate stage. You go here, between this, or go back to here. So initially, going back and forth, you know, electro size big enough, you have only that way. There's between here to here, there's nothing here. But you have this, you have this. Okay? You have this, then you have to don't have any possibility of forming charge domain wall. And then you can think about here, this one and that one does not form the charge domain wall. So in this way, no chance to form the charge domain wall during the switching, then we expect no, no fatigue. So when you do that and switch back and forth, and then, as grown fellow, after 10 to the 6 cycles, cycles like a million cycles, and then this one, no change. Can you see that one? So previously, I showed that number of cycles. You see the additional domain forms. But here, even million cycles, and this one does not form additional domain forms. So that means, clearly we show is Monodomain approach here. The, the reason I want to talk, I'm talking about this, this monodomain system allow you to study retention and fatigue 
and even next one I'm going to show you magnetoelectric coupling and very easy to do that without monodomain we don't know what's going on and then you have this whole sample, this whole area sample like a millimeter or 10 millimeter size or 10 millimeter size sample everywhere is the same kind of single domain you have to switch it. So when you do that your switching fatigue, 71 switching after million cycles the fatigue. So now I think a fatigue mechanism here is formation of charge domain or in one 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 state and first time people say okay I prefer to use one 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 BF4 rather than one zero zero BF4 because you can see that 100 BF4 radiation is roughly 60 microcoulombs per second. Okay, can you see that 60? Okay. 60 microcoulomb. All right, this is not the highest one. It's lower than BF4, uh, the uh, lead titanate. But 111, 111 is initially <coughs> over 100. Okay, 110 is almost twice higher for radiation. But problem is over cycle. It drops down around the 50 number of cycles, or even later, it drops even more after more cycles. But in 100 case, 100 case, you cycle this and start with the 60, but ends up still 60, and then no sign of degradation at all. So that is very simple way you can determine. And using monodomain, in the monodomain approach actually tells what is the mechanism of retention and then what is the mechanism of the fatigue and how you solve the problem or fatigue problem using 180 switching to 70 domain switching, 100 film rather than 111 film. Okay? So that is the one simple is monodomain makes your science is much easier and also you understand the mechanism for reliability issue and then that's the one. Okay. Any questions about this so far? Okay, so here, monodomain is a good model system. It's a model system, it's a good model system and unstable switching stabilized by BF4 small island, it's a smaller device. And switching is fatigue resistant due to the simple path like 71 to switching. And this one actually provides design rule for reliable performance of multifunctional device controlled by equation switching and using monodomain approach. Okay, so that's a one part of this monodomain <coughs> using BFO. And then after take a few questions, then I'm gonna go talk about magnetoelectric coupling of different threads. Any questions? Do you understand this? I, I, I keep keep showing the RSM, or this program spin mapping, and then also showing this uh, some of the PFM image. But I think anybody use a PFM here? PSO scanning microscope? Anybody use a PFM? AFM. So AFM, you can actually use additional functionality of your AFM, and you can image the your uh, ferroelectric image, or that can be also used to magnetic image, like MFM, and the additional functions you can do. How many of you are working on the multiferrex system here? Multiferrex. Anybody study multiferrex? Only one multiferrex? Nobody is magnetic materials? Magnetic, soft to barrel magnetic. Okay. Iron, cobalt, also more like a metals, yeah. metal systems. <coughs> okay, so you have a your community here is more like a metallic systems, not the uh, inorganic material systems. Is that right? Okay, so maybe next next topic is a little involves some magnetism, and then uh, so we'll let's talk about next topic. Uh, Okay, so next one is 
this is a magnetoelectric coupling, and then when you switch the electric for, electric for, uh, for, uh, for agent switching, and how this magnetoelectric coupling happens, I think that's a, another fundamental question. And then, you know, to study this, you really need some sort of like a simple model system, and then we can really see what's going on. That's why we use a monodomain state. So monodomain, this one, allow you to do magnetic coupling, and then uh, maybe I will show you here. And then uh, the way studied is bismuth ferrite and this antiferromagnetic material, and then cobalt is ferromagnetic material. So if you remember that I showed you the first slide is like a structure, exchange coupling, and using tunneling device. Okay. So the way built this one is viscous substrate, monodomain, and strontium luthane bottom electrode, so that can switch the polarization of BFO, but at the same time, switch the antiferromagnetic order, and then you lay down with a cobalt layer with a ferromagnetic material, not making full tunnel junctions, whether, what is the relationship is coupling these two. And then make this island and cobalt layer and then deposit very thin layer of aluminum to prevent oxidation because uh, the thickening is very, very thin. The reason we use uh, this layer very, very thin and we use the pin photoelectron uh, microscope and the photo <coughs> photoemission electron microscope and that is, it's a uh, the synchrotron work, I mean, this, we, we have to travel to UK. And here, to, uh, in the uh, UK, there's a very nice uh, that, uh, the, uh, uh, the synchrotron PIM system. And then this basically study cobalt or like, an ion. Ion is spin structure ion in bismuth ferrite. Okay, this is antiferromagnetic order. Antiferromagnetic order is ion. And then ferromagnetic order, cobalt, we can separately, we can study it because a synchrotron is, is a scheme like XMCD or XMLD. Do you know what the XMCD, XMLD? Okay. The linear dichroism, a circular dichroism, and that is the way you can determine antiferromagnetic order or ferromagnetic order by imaging and then you can determine the structure. So there's a lot of you guys doing magnetic work. Okay. So magnetic work you can do many different ways of calculation. You have a magnetic measurement by like a magnetometer. You can measure the uh, magnetic optic, like a curve rotation, Mokh measurement. And then you can do neutron scattering to magnetic spin structure. Or you can do this kind of synchrotron work to elementary specific measurement because you can tune the energy you can tune the energy absorption, and then you can elementor specifically, I can determine cobalt edge or iron edge, and then you can determine what order it is. Okay? So that's the advantage of this synchrotron soft x-ray, can determine the magnetic structures of elemental. So this pin, size of this area we can probe, is like a 10 to 50 micron field of view. Which means the field of view is a lot bigger than domain size in multi-domain structure. Multi-domain structure, each domain less than micron or much smaller, like a few hundred nanometers. So that means this field of view is a lot bigger. You have to average the whole thing. So that's why monodomain allow you to do probing whole thing. Okay? So when you do that, you're probing both two ways you can do. One is here, this circular dichroism. Okay, circular dichroism determined, you know that it's a, your, your synchrotron X-ray beam is circular this way or circular that way. Okay, you have two different ways. And coupled with the spins of your ferromagnetic material, and you can determine which orientation of cobalt magnetization. And that's what we call circular and then this is the next one with a linear dichroism. The linear dichroism is determined antiferromagnetic order because the antiferromagnetic material does not have a net moment, but still it can couple with linearly crop, linearly uh, polarized your synchrotron beam, 
and with the orientation relationship, all these things, we can see that what direction of spin structure is. Okay? So, so there's a linear dichrism and a circular dichrism. We can do everything in the single sample, elementary specific, we can determine it in one on domain state. So in here, in order to do linear dichrism measurement, you can actually do the same kind of measurement, like X-ray diffractometer with motors, and phi, and chi, and this orientation, and relationship between your instant beam, and then you have an intensity of this, and then you measure this. And then so we, at the same time, pull down and pull up, down and up. Okay? You switch in situ, in situ down and up. We know that the Fourier switching what is the antiferromagnetic order of bismuthferrite? What is the ferromagnetic order of this one? You can map out at the same time. Okay. Do, do you get it, this one? So this is something, is, in order to you know, understand it, I think you may have to do something. It's a simple system, but you want to do in situ and measurement. So, interestingly, you look at this uh, vector map, down polarization, up polarization, you actually see that down polarization, up polarization is a spin structure, it's a, a ferromagnetic domain structure, switches like very clearly. And then down polarization, up and again, down again, and this one come back again very similar, and you can see that magnetic the vector map shows initially all the, the uh, ferromagnetic domain aligned along that direction. Then when you switch up, switch up and you go 90 degree switch. So that means yeah, this one is cobalt layer. This cobalt layer is a when you do ferroelectric switching this way and then somehow your ferromagnetic layer switches like this. You get it? So that means this layers of very thin layer of cobalt here, this cobalt layer and switches in plane like this by switching BFO layer this way. So this is a purely, you see, magnetoelectric coupling. So switch electric electric polarization by electric field, switch the magnetization. Can you see that? But it's indirectly. It's not really coming from here. And this one somehow antiferromagnetic switching induced this ferromagnetic switch. Okay? So that means you see that switching here, clearly down state and up state and down state makes ferromagnetic state this way, 90 degree, come back again. Okay? So PIM, okay, XMCD PIM, X-ray like a circular dichroism, and then this one, magnetic circular dichroism shows very clear rotation of this. And how this thing happened? And then this uh, MOCO measurement, is, which is macroscopic measurement, also shows down polarization to up polarization, and you clearly see that switching of magnetization. Easy axis to, and then hard axis. I think magnetic people know this, right? You guys do that. So you have seen this uh, easy axis down, uh, the up state, easy axis along that direction, and top variation and the hard axis. So you have clearly C and then switching by this electric field of this and switch the magnetization of cobalt to it. Okay? Now, how this thing happen in between these two? So exchange coupling between between these two over layer and now we we'll understand interfering order of this one, right? And then this interfering order is known as we call spin cycloid. Anybody know the spin cycloid? Anybody some say it? Okay. So you have a antiferromagnetic state. It's a lot of antiferromagnetic state. It's the many G type or many different types. Interfering order, your your spin is cancel each other by pointing the other direction. Right? Okay, that's the one way. The spin is can be this way and that way, and then different location of atom, they cancel. 
Some other spins cancel each other by frustrated like this. Okay? Frustrated ferromagnet. Right? Okay, so the frustrated the spin exists, but you have to cancel each other by frustration. Another way here in this, this is a BF4 is studied is known as spin cycloid. Okay? The spin is the cycloid. And then spin cycloid some pure density is you have spin cycloid within this plane and then this plane and spin cycloid along that direction, like the spin is like a cycling like this. Okay? The cycling comes like a periodicity about the 64 nanometer. This is studied by by single crystal, bulk single crystal, and initially to really understand this magnetism as spin and magnetic coupling, and then they did it, there's a neutron diffraction, neutron scattering, and then other detecting most power and then many different ways, and then trying to find the what is the spin structure. And then I'm not gonna go details of a spin cycloid, what is this one takes a long time to, to, to explain it, but the way of this one in, in within this plane, and the three possible spin cycloids happening in the in the, this kind of location. So the, we call this a propagation vector. The pro propagation, which direction a spin cycle is going? And then this kind of rotation happens which plane? Okay, that plane, within the plane, you have a, a propagation vector along that direction, and you get this kind of spin cycle. Okay? So how the spin cycloid actually started, and then in bulk single crystal, in a boxing crystal, they have a three different spin cycloid, and then one going that way, one going that direction, one going that direction. You have a three different direction of spin cycloid in boxing crystal because that's a it's degree of freedom because of this uh, box BF4 boxing crystal does not have a spin chip breaking. Then you get three of those. But in our case, in the in thin films, people also studied spin cycloid is depending on your strength. Your bulk looks like this kind of spin cycloid, bulk material, and then bulk has a three di different degree of freedom. But in films, you depending on different substrate, spin cycloid has different spin cycloid. At a certain point, your strain is big, and strong spin cycloid destroyed. And it destroyed in going back to regular interferometry. Okay. Interferometric state. So spin is cycling like this to like this, and then depending on strain state. And the spin cycloid here, different region of of the strain state, tensile strain and compressed strain, you get the different things. Okay. So I'm, this is some more detail, but I'm not gonna this main point I'm saying. And then only study the monodomain BF4 film, partially relaxed. <coughs> you get the bulk like spin cycloid in the previous work. But our neutron scattering in our bulk and our thin films, a spin cycloid plane is not exactly the same as bulk plane. It's a different plane. So this one in the neutron diffraction is you have only two. Okay, which means you have here three. Okay? So you have a three variables of spin cycloid in the BF4 in bulk material, <coughs> but in thin films, you have only one. So you're breaking the symmetry of this by monodomain, and plus somehow you miscut or strain and reduce the spin cycloid interferometric state from three to one, which is really nice because not only ferroelastic domain or ferroelectric domain you reduce to one, but even antiferromagnetic domain from three to one. Do you, do you understand that? Bulk material, bulk single crystal, like a crystallographically or ferroelastic domain, a single monodomain, but magnetically antiferromagnetic domain is not monodomain. They found that three variables. But in thin films, somehow you have a strain or a constraint and reduce this one to one. From if you have a three, you will see this, and you will see this, and you will see all three. But you can see only two of those. And you're plotting this and switching up and switching down and still monodomain. 
So this one makes your interpretation is very simple. Federal elastic domain, mono domain, and is is a magnetic antiferric domain is mono domain. Both are mono domain, and you end up and simulation of this. What is domain structure? And the domain structure of spin cycloid looks like this. This one requires some fitting of the neutron. I'm not going to go into details of this. Neutron fittings and the spin cycle plane is not the same as Bok. And then you see that this one is very close to the surface of 100 plane. Can you see that? It's very close to that. Compared to, compared to this, spin cycle plane is slanted like this. Can you see that? So this spin cycle plane is here, but later this plane in the thin, thin film is very close to this plane. Okay? So that can be determined by this neutron diffraction. Okay? So that is probing the whole bulk material of thin films, and you can determine what the spin cycloid and but we can also measure the pin measurement of this antiferromagnetic order is a ferrite. And when you do that and pull and boil down state, and it's a lot complicated, you can see. And then doing this measurement, the different phi angle and then tilting angle with respect to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, synchrotron linear polarized beam. And then you fit the data, then you can determine what the spin cycle is. So in down variation, the spin cycloid of this uh, measured by PIM is very similar to measured by neutron. Okay? So neutron data is a bulk material, and PIM is a very surface sensitive measurement. Those two spin cycloid antiferromagnetic structure is consistent. Okay? Neutron data and PIM data, XMCD PIM data is I'm sorry, XML, XMLD PIM data, those are consistent. Looking at this and then looking at PIM measurement, very similar. Okay, down polarizing state. But up polarizing state is somehow your fitting <coughs> is you have to use a two different components. One is spin cycloid, like measured by neutron, this kind of component. But you have a small component of regular antiferromagnetic order. So we cannot directly probe which one is where, but it's our actual interpretation, simple interpretation is maybe bulk, bulk regions looks like this, then maybe surface region close interface more like this, facing to ion or the cobalt layer. So those two relationship, you can determine this monodomain state and using this and here initially down polarization state looks like this and the bulk region looks like that and interfacial region of BFO looks like that is consistent everywhere when you switch the up when you switch the operation up and then operation is a determined by neutron more likely this way, and then near the surface region, and it looks like this. And then when you switch back, <coughs> so how does it influence the ferromagnetic layer? And then you have ferromagnetic layer, down polarization state is interfering with the ferromagnetic layer in this direction, and then up state is related to interfering order the near the surface and then that direction. So the interferomagically ferromagnetic layer are lined along the interferomagnetic layer. So that is, is you can actually see relationship all three. So the, the, the reason I emphasize this approach is using single mono domain, you study all the switching down and up state of radiation can measure spin cycloid, antiferromagnetic state, bulk regions or interfacial regions separately and at the same time you can look at the ferromagnetic layer on top of this, measure this by XMCD 
and you can see the relationship and mechanism you can actually determine. But without this monodomain, this one is not possible. And then, and then this in situ measurement by synchrotron really allow you to do this. So I think if you have any any ferromagnetic system you really study and then a fundamental important mechanism and then this uh, synchrotron based elemental specific synchrotron based XMCD XMLD is very useful. Okay, that's what I have here. So, so we have to see the monodomain allow you to do actually anti ferromagnetic order change up and down state and then this one is deterministic and robust and this one what we have found here is many many cycles previously remember that is only three cycles and the dives remember that okay with a multi domain state and only few cycles but this one because due to the deterministic like of this kind of state no fatigue and deterministic that's why this one after many many cycles still the magnetic <coughs> coupling we can actually see that <coughs> so right now I think we have roughly 12 o'clock, 12 15 and then um, I want to take some questions first then I'll talk about some of the uh, silicon and then today's lecture is about the silicon integration so I'm going to talk some of those any questions? Yes. Uh, how much was the exchange field that you got in this case in the, this, uh, this Smith right and uh, So actually you can see, you can see that here is magnetic field here is is uh, roughly um, a millitesla of here, like a like a fifty millitesla, and then you exchange bias here. I, I cannot actually plot this one. I think we have to blow up this one to see it. But it's a very small magnetic field. And sir, for, for device application point of view, like how much uh, how much exchange field should we have? It, sh it has to be very high or low or what range? I think a device point of view, I think that people more care about how much energy you require. Because uh, you have, uh, it's uh, one of the issue, is the biggest issue people are trying to solve in the magnetic decoupling is a switching voltage for for the parallel switching and then they have a, this one is a, what voltage you require so you know the coefficient field of BFO is quite big so which means the, the voltage required switching 10 volts is a lot of energy required so you know make this one like a like a hundred millivolts of switching you know goes hundred millivolts switching you need what kind of coefficient field needed and then what thickness you need. Because the thickness get thicker, you need a larger voltage. You get thinner, you get smaller voltage. But you cannot go too thin. You go too thin, the leakage is your problem. So one of the issues is how can you reduce the coefficient field and how to reduce the thickness of this. And then that's what we call like a milli, millivolt, like 200 millivolt or 300 millivolt, that's a range. I think a lot of other, other places they're looking at reduce the voltage, reduce the power. Any other questions about this? Uh, what should be the polling voltage and the duration? I mean, if you want to pull the ferroelectric material. Ferromagnetic or ferroelectric? Ferroelectric. Then what should be the voltage in that PFM? How much voltage we should apply? It will depend on the coercive field and for how much duration? A uh, few seconds or something? Oh, it doesn't need a few seconds. It's, it's actually much faster than this. When you scan it, when you're scanning speed, is very fast. So the voltage required is depending on, as I said, your coefficient field. Coefficient field high, you need a larger, larger field. And then your PFM measurement, usually PFM comes with the electronics, is like roughly less than, usually running 20 volt or less. But if you want to go higher voltage, you have an external like, power supply attached to you can go higher voltage. But usually run range of 10 volts or 20 volts or less. Before going to PFM, we should test the device also and it should not break down also. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually better 
that's better. And then uh, you're testing of this electrical measurement. You know the switching of ferroelectric tester? Yeah, P loop. Yeah, measure the P loop. You know what is the saturation and how much your field you need, and you can actually see that. And then that is the first approximation to, to look at the PFM. But PFM is the different PFM and the P measurement. And the electric field and PFM is not uniform. Because when you PFM tip, and the electric field distribution is not very uniform like a elect uniform electrode. So one of the uh, hard thing is, what is the effective electric field? Even the tip voltage may be 10 volts. But maybe tip region and then certain different regions, the field is different. So then that's why you have to do something, try. I mean, first approximation from the electrical measurement, P measurement, but I think we can start somewhere. Any more questions about this? I don't think you need to know all the details of magnetic coupling here because the, the reason I bring this several examples, specific examples, is using this a simple domain engineering and allow you to do and then this kind of uh, mechanism studies and then reliable switching and then uh, more reliable and then retention and fatigue and then all these things. Another one a message I'm giving here is your tool here we have is ideally to study this kind of complex issue of magnetic coupling, and then we use the three multiple components of ideas. Number one, we use a simple model system monodomy. Number two, we use a in situ, in situ measurement during the switching. So take take the exact same sample, exactly same device, the exact same spot switch down and switch up. Look at those regions, what exactly happened. So that's what we call in situ measurement or more direct measurement of those. And then other thing I'm talking about here, in order to look at all different orders, because we are talking about interfering order, ferromagnetic order, and ferroelectric order, we have all different orders. And then in situ, all three orders at the same time, can you look at those? Not at the same time, the same device, look at those things. So in order to do... Diffusion also for the interface, I mean the interface should be abrupt. Interface is very abrupt. Because material we are going anti-ferromagnetic, I mean the multi-ferroic, then ferromagnetic one, insulator and ferromagnetic two. So all should be, I think, abrupt. That's a very good point. Especially exchange coupling. Interface is very important, exchange coupling. Because exchange coupling has a very small the distance. And then the, the, the way we, we grow this material is, is uh, all the BF4 and strontium ruthenate grow on high temperature because we have to grow at tax area. But when you grow this cobalt and aluminum, we deposit at room temperature. Because when you go high temperature, you, you have this kind of, this kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the uh, interdiffusion or anything. But something we cannot really uh, actually 100% sure. So when you, this is a common problem, when you put down metals on top of oxide, okay, when you put down metal and oxide material, some oxide material, some metals are very reactive. And then that reactive metal suck oxygen from oxide and forming very thin air oxide. And this is something, when you deposit gold, okay, when you Deposit gold, and then uh, gold does not suck oxygen because gold is stable itself. I'm very happy to gold. But when you deposit like a titanium or something very reactive one, and they have tendency of sucking oxygen from from the some material which easily can give up oxygen. So here, one is possibility when it may be monolayer region at the surface possibility of sucking oxygen from bismuth, uh, bismuth ferrite and then the cobalt is not as reactive as titanium and hopefully we don't have that issue but room temperature your kinetics is, is the energy is the kinetic value is so high so we believe 
that the surface is relatively sharp. And then another evidence is not this particular system. I think some of the students did a strand immediate working on. Who is a strand immediate? Strand immediate. And then we studied some spin orbit torque, spin orbit torque measurement of pomoloy on strand immediate. I think this is a like a large strand immediate as a large spin orbit coupling. And then when you study this spin orbit coupling and then spin torque measurement, spin hole conductivity measurement, we have to use a pomeroy on top of a strand immediate. And then we took the sample and then cross-section on TEM and look at the interface and then we did not see any indication of reaction at the interface because of those things drawn at room temperature. No, cobalt is not taxial. Cobalt is is polycrystalline because cobalt is uh, crystal structure. Cobalt, I think, the HCP, yeah, HCP, and then BFO is is uh, um, the perovskite structure. <coughs> so uh, it, it's not it's not epitaxial. It's I think random polycrystalline. But nickel, nickel grow epitaxially on perovskite. And we have other examples of the nickel and pomeloy also grow up taxiary on perovskite too. So this, this loop is to Okay, so this one, the magnetic is in plane switching. Okay, we see that the, I think that's what we measure here is 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 in plane switch. But the, in in the uh, in the uh, anti-fermi order on the line is switching is this switching. This switching coupled with anti-fermi order, and anti-fermi order is switching. Remember that anti-fermi order here. Uh, this one, and this direction is same direction that way. So that's what we determine which direction of the anti-fermi. Loop is showing an isotropy. Loop is showing an yeah, this, uh, this MH2 is anastropy of the cobalt. Yeah, in plane. Mock measurement. It's a mock measurement. So do you know the mock measurement? Magnetic optic. And then for uh, if, uh, the uh, curl rotation. And this is a mock measurement because of the surface sensitive. And then because we want to measure only regions of electrode. We are not measuring the whole thing. You switch that. So we have to focus, you have focus the laser beam to look at those regions of device. So, uh, which interface is better for exchange bias, like the epitaxial grown uh, on the epitaxial grown layers of the normal grown layers? The ideally, it's an interpretation, everything is better to have everything in epitaxial. So in here, one way to you can actually study better is rather than cobalt, you can deposit lanthanum, strontium manganate. Okay, that's a ferromanganate. Okay, anybody know lanthanum strontium manganate? Anybody working on lanthanum strontium manganate? Okay. So the ferromanganate material. The problem is lanthanum strontium manganate is, is a well known for many, many other studies like the manganate tunnel junctions. Okay, manganate tunnel junction, people use lanthanum strontium manganate, strontium titanate, and tunnel junction. Problem of lanthanum strontium manganate. <coughs> Bulk Curie temperature is roughly 360 Kelvin, a bulk. And then very close room temperature. And the previous study of many, many years ago, they did uh, spin polarized of uh, the uh, synchrotron measurement. And then they look at the uh, what is the transient temperature. Bulk 360, the surface magnetization temperature is not low. So that means we trust this one, 360 Kelvin, but the interfacial region is <coughs> not. Sorry. Interface region is not ferromagnetic. So I think that's something is too close to that. And that's why other people use, I mean, the cobalt and metal, which is not ideal, like, like epitaxial, but QD temperature is high. And that's one of it. But in the interferometer order is epitaxially not easy to explain the spin structure underneath the interferometer layer and what the easy axis on the layer, and then that's easier. The cobalt layer is for the crystal.
Any more questions? Yes. If I grow BTO on SQO, DATIO. TTO. Uh, that is tetragonal. So it will have like up and down polarization state. And if I want to see the evolution of domain also, if I have pole in one direction and I will switch. And if I want to see the evolution of the domains, so how they are coming in PFM image. So it will, it should be like in, in plane PFM I should do or out of plane? If you go PF4, normally PF4 samples in normal substrate, not very a taxically good one. <clears throat> you end up C domain or A domain, you get both. Especially if film is thick, you feel it relaxed, you get this, you get that. And then this one, or this one, or in plane, this one too. You have two. So if you look at the in plane imaging, then you will see this one, you will see that the in plane imaging shows such regions like different contrast than this region. But if you go film is very thin, and this A domain doesn't form. It's only this domain forms. Okay? 100% that. And then, then your switching is 100% going this way, going that way, back and forth. Okay? So depending on thickness and then th th depending on your domain structure grows. So it's a more likely very thick film you end up messy domain structure. Very thin one is only up and down. And then those things can be easily can be seen. It's just x-ray. Not even go, not you don't have to go even to PFM because you you have this way and that way. Your lattice parameter of this one long, this one lattice parameter short. Okay, that means you just a simple X-ray scan, theta two theta scan, use the peak splitting. Okay, one coming from longer lattice parameter, which is a smaller angle, and then A domain. Is a this long axis for and the shorter axis A and B. This one is a shorter, so that angle coming later. So that's a your peak is double peak. Okay, you know this one is a multi domain, and then this one is aligned this way, aligned that way. You have those two, and you measure offset is one on one scan, phi scan. And with the phi scan, you only see two peaks every hundred degree and everything aligned that way. But you have this one every 90 degree, you get this one and you get that one. So you can see all the domain structures without going ferroelectric measurement, just x-ray measurement, because that's coupled with a structural domain, with a, with a structural uh, distortion. And that's why in here, a lot of measurement, we use the x-ray diffraction and RSM and then combine with the PFM. But PFM give additional information because uh, is a ferroelectric, ferroelectric uh, the uh, structural measurement, for example, X-ray diffraction measurement, cannot tell this one or that one. Normal measurement, you cannot do it. Because a very tiny difference, this one and that one. Synchrotron, you can do it. Synchrotron, you know that. But the PFM measurement, you know which one is which. But X-ray diffraction measurement, because peak position of the this one and that one is almost identical. Any more, more? Okay, so then we have about like a half an hour. I think I'm gonna talk about brief introduction of the integration of silicon thing, and then or you wanna you have any questions about this today's topic? I think some students ask about uh, how to use RSM in your X-ray diffractometer things. And then also RSM is one way to actually determine this. But maybe you can use um, different uh, scans, phi scans, and then theta scans, or two theta scans, and chi scans, just those scans. And then provide other information too, it's complementary. So maybe I can bring those things and then the next time. And you want to cover certain particular things you want to know, then I'll bring more. So I'm doing something the order of this is not exactly the same order of the uh, schedule we did, because I think that's the way. And then, um, so any particular subject you're interested in?
Anybody has done silicon capacity? I think less people here doing silicon as a substrate. Is that correct? Silicon, epitaxial silicon, or no, not epitaxial silicon? Just silicon sulfate to add as a sulfate material. Okay. I'm going to uh, talk about like a short, like a 15, 20 minutes about the silicon integration. And then, uh, so this is uh, probably one of the um, very challenging epitaxial question. And then, uh, silicon structure is, uh, what is radical silicon structure? A silicon is a diamond cubic. <coughs> And the lattice parameter is 5.4 or something, it's quite big. And silicon is very, very reactive. And as soon as you expose the silicon in, in the any oxygen environment, it forms SiO2, which amorphously. And then one of the early questions people are trying to actually address is there's a lot of computers, people use the computers. And then computer, most of the computer is a MOS device, like a field effect. So you have a metal oxide, like SiO2. SiO2 is a dielectric layer, gay dielectric layer. Okay? And the direct constant of gay dielectrics, silicon is, what's the direct constant of silicon? Anybody know? Do you know what the direct constant? Silicon is, what do you say? Like a four or five, very very small, four or five. But I think a silicon dioxide is the, one of the best dielectric in silicon, which is the forming very low defect density and then very easy to form by by thermal oxidation, even very uniform and down to very very thin. But the, <clears throat> when you look at the capacitance, the capacitance to make a like a like a the, the field effect by right? capacitance. What's a capacitance C? What the C is is a proportional to what? Capacitance, you know the you know this physics, right? C equals what? Direct constant times area divided by thickness, right? You all know this, right? So that's the rule. So in order to get this uh, capacitance is actually get smaller and smaller device, capacitance gets smaller and smaller, and certain point is too small. And then in order to overcome this this the capacitance smaller one and increase the capacitance and with the same material that I count to four or five, what is other variable? What's the variable? It? Thickness. Shrink the thickness. Thickness shrink, then your capacitance goes up. Okay, so you have a area goes down to compensate it. You can actually thickness go down. But thickness go down and down. At certain point, thickness too thin, the tunneling happens. So that means this device, silicon device, they're trying to make this one <coughs> overcome this, get thin, thinner and thinner and thinner. Certain point. I cannot go any more thinner. So, only way next step is overcome this problem is changing the material. Changing the material from silicon dioxide to high dye constant material. And then obviously, high dye constant material, the simple way to do is which one? Perovskite. What's the dye constant of the front of titanium at room temperature? 300. Okay. So huge, 300, compared to 5. Which means, if you can integrate strontium, titanium, and silicon, then with the same thickness and same area, or you can reduce the size of this, lot smaller. And that constant, the silicon, strontium, titanium, low temperature is huge, much higher. 
But room temperature drives, 300 is still good. So one of the initial motivation is people trying to integrate this this perovskite material on silicon is trying to use a gate, gate dielectrics. Okay. So you can make a gate dielectrics with this, and that can be a huge gate. But two problems. Number one is integration of silicon, strontium titanium silicon, and then like very uniform properties. The nice thing about SiO2 is armor force. So no grain boundary. The armor force is grow beautifully everywhere, and property is very uniform everywhere, and they grow very well, and property armor force is, is good. When you grow this strontium titanate <coughs> on top of it, <clears throat> you can end up polycrystalline, and then surface froth, and then a lot of problems. And then you have a reaction at the interface, and a lot of things. And then in order to overcome this problem, people are thinking about is, can you grow strontium titanate, it's a perovskite material, perfect single crystal on silicon? Can it be done? That's a, one of the interesting question. And then you look at this silicon one. This is a actual, I'm showing the result. And strontium titanate and silicon, you epitaxially grow beautifully well. And then how this thing happen? If the structure is different, and then oxide is different, and then it happens. So abrupt the silicon interface, crucial coupling of normal functional into silicon to this, but initially they are interested in gate dielectrics. So silicon dioxide strong and more robust than study oxide and silicon. So you see that you look at the interfacial region, you have silicon at the first layer has to be strontium. Okay? So first approach is you calculate thermodynamic stability of this. Once you titanium lay down silicon first, you, you look at the binary binary phase diagram. Strontium uh, the titanium react with silicon forming titanium silicide. Do you know this silicide? Okay, silicide formation. Once you form the silicide, it's no longer perovskite structure. Okay? So in order to overcome this problem, the way to do is put down strontium first, not titanium first. They're putting down strontium and then without titanium. And then once you form strontium lay down, then later you put down titanium on it. Okay, you have to sequence is changed, then you cannot grow that way. So ferroelectric transistor, like for the ferroelectric oxide and non-volatile switch, and non-volatile, and a lot of devices requires this kind of SiO2 here, but I think a strontium titanate can be very useful for that one. And then the technique they use, oxide and BE, okay, the only tool that allows to grow at this point, a silicon, because you put down strontium, ultra high vacuum, without any oxygen, and strontium goes in, and once you go, the next layer, you put down the strontium and titanium together. So, look at the strontium silicon interfacial structure of the silicon, it looks like this, and then put down strontium on top, and then this uh, reaction, and this is a lot of study in different models, model A and model B, but once you form strontium layer on top, and then you can grow either barium titanate or strontium titanate, you can grow the same way. And then atomic structure here is a much more complicated silicon and strontium titanate. You see that the strontium silicon and then here strontium, and then your titanium on top here. Okay, so we have a lot of practical device to use this, and then uh, device challenges here. But I think I'm going to talk about. Uh, let me see. I think uh, 
be a silicon, semiconductor potentially less re reactive than silicon with oxygen, but you can use the same thing, germanium and other things, but then in titanate grown on germanium, and you can see that too. So the germanium, it's a diamond structure, and you can the band titanate on top here. Okay? So the base, basic idea here is you can actually see strontium titanium silicon can be done by rotation of 45 degree on the surface. So it's a, we call this is a orientation diagonal direction, one half of the diagonal direction, then match with the strontium titanate. So they can actually grow on top. And I'm going to talk about, and then next time, and then how the strontium titanium or silicon allow you to do many interesting and the science and then device. So one of them is like a MEMS device, like a microelectron mechanical system, micro, microelectron uh, uh, micro mechanical system, MEMS device, and requires like a silicon processing, kind of etching and then free sending and then and then cantilevers and those things. Integration silicon is very important. So all this one will be discussed next time when I talk about. It. Piezoelectric materials, giant piezoelectric material, and the silicon also used to to study some other bismuth ferrite, the freestanding membranes, and I'll, I'll talk about that too. Okay, so I just briefly introduce this, and then I'll then I want to stop it, and then I'll maybe few uh, maybe ten minutes, and we can have a discussion, and then I'll, then I think we can meet tomorrow, and then. Uh, so the talk I'm going to do is uh, <coughs> uh, we have a two more uh, day Tuesday, right? Today Tuesday, Tuesday. So we have a two more days, and then uh, Wednesday and Thursday. So uh, one day we'll do longer session in the afternoon. So we cover one ad additional lectures last uh, last week. So uh, we have a uh, one session we'll do. Uh, the interface, two-dimensional electron gas and two-dimensional whole gas. Anybody working on interface, oxide interfaces here? How many of oxide interfaces? Okay. So I talk about oxide interfaces. Is the interface is an important aspect. And then I'll, I'll talk about the uh, piezoelectric material, giant piezoelectric materials. And then I'll talk about some superconductivity. Anybody working on superconductivity? How many people working on superconductivity? Okay. So. Anybody working on the uh, oxide superconductors or non-conventional superconductors? Non-conventional. Okay. So let's talk about the superconductivity, and then we use the same kind of issues, and then maybe I can spend a little more time for superconductivity, and then a little bit of history of it, how we came here, and then what we are doing, and then we talk about it. So uh, maybe tomorrow I will do start with. Uh, um, uh, it doesn't matter which way, all right? If, if it, it's critical which way, I think we can do superconducting first and two electron gas later, or I think we do that way. Okay, and uh, we can stop it, and then we can formal informal discussion about. It.